Thank you so much, Ed, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, we're good with the mic. Can you all hear me back there? Yes. Excellent. Use the mic, please. Use the mic, please. <laughs> I am using the mic. My mic, the mic is uh, pinned on. Any other problems? <laughs> well, I'm very pleased to be here with you today at the conference on smart growth and its social and environmental implications. My talk is called A Field Guide to Sprawl, How to Decode Everyday American Landscapes. Most Americans inhabit complex metropolitan landscapes layered with suburban tracts, strips, malls, office parks, and highways. Few of us can decode their physical forms or explain their economic origins. We might use the words city, suburb, and countryside, but many metropolitan landscapes defy these older definitions. By landscape, I mean what geographers call the cultural landscape, the combination of natural and built elements that will define the character of the place. And I study both what has been built through sites and buildings and drawings and documents, and also how the built environment has been represented in art, literature, and popular culture. Most of all, I look at processes, how the cultural landscape is produced, and after it's been shaped, how it frames everyday life, what activities the built environment might support or constrain. Today, I'm going to discuss briefly my two recent books. First is called Building Suburbia, Green Fields and Urban Growth and is a history of American suburbs from 1820 to 2000. And then the second book is called A Field Guide to Sprawl. First, I want to review for you the argument of building suburbia, which is that Americans have created seven types of complex suburban landscapes since 1820, and that those landscapes were based on growth that was not smart growth. These are landscapes we can't repair unless we can distinguish their layers. Then, I will turn to the second book and give you examples of bad building patterns from the three most recent landscapes. My second book is a dictionary of sprawl. And as I review some of those patterns, I think we can discuss uh, whether I was right to posit that there were seven layers in the American suburban landscape, or whether really we should simply categorize them as the landscapes before and after federal subsidies for sprawl. And that would mean there are two major landscapes and not seven. So for the first book, Building Suburbia. Suburbs are everywhere in the United States. And when I started work on this book in the late 1990s, I faced some very difficult choices about how to define suburban landscapes. The census calls suburbs the non-central city parts of metropolitan areas. In the 2000 census, there were about 150 million suburban residents in the United States who outnumbered 85 million urban ones and 56 million rural ones. And I think the 2010 census, which is still being uh, calculated and processed, will give us some even more striking figures. The literature at the moment is vast. There are hundreds of excellent books and articles about specific suburbs, but there have been relatively few attempts to write an overarching history of suburban America. When I began my project, the standard line about suburbs was that in the post-World War II era, automobiles allowed white male workers of diverse ethnic backgrounds to settle their wives and children in suburban communities outside city centers, and thus become what we call middle class. We could challenge many of the def definitions and assumptions uh, in that sense, but it was really clear that by 2000, the white male breadwinner family with a stay-at-home mom and children living in a peaceful colonial with a leafy yard and sociable neighbors 
predominated only in reruns of all sitcoms. The predominant family type in the suburbs uh, had shifted. Singles were 29% of all suburban households, young or old. Uh, 30 to 50% of people of color resided in suburban communities, and 50% of immigrants born elsewhere resided in suburbs. So it's clear that if you wish to continue to pursue suburban history, there better be a very sophisticated analysis of gender, class, and race that's part of the project. I began uh, to move away from this uh, older account of the suburb as home for the male commuter and the female housewife uh, by looking much more carefully at real estate developers uh, rather than at homeowners. So I was looking more at how space was produced than how it was consumed, and I found the concept of the growth machine, uh, which is a term that uh, sociologist Harvey Mala coined back in the 70s and then developed uh, later with John Logan, was very useful to understand the pro-growth activities of political machines composed of suburban land speculators, builders, bankers, their trade associations, and their allies uh, in elected or appointed government positions. And by focusing on the development process and the question of who was making profit, uh, I was able to analyze the disappointment some suburban development has evoked in this country, and I was able to critique the specific practices of certain developers without attacking suburbs in general or blaming residents because they had chosen to live there. After quite a lot of time in the archives, I divided the history of suburban construction into seven typical vernacular landscapes. And all seven of these continue to exist, um, but it's sometimes quite difficult to see them because most political entities include fragments and overlays and erasures of more than one pattern. Suburban growth has been constant across political boundaries. So you have to train yourself to look for these layers in the landscape and to understand that they may not coincide with the boundaries of any particular town. And of course, for all of the um, proposals about political reform, it makes it more complicated um, if you're really thinking about dealing with seven different kinds of landscapes. But part of my contention has been all along that you can't begin to repair these suburban landscapes unless you can separate them and distinguish them and understand them. Different, there will be a different kind of repair needed in a different situation. So let's just run through these seven and I'll show you some images. Number one, the borderlands. Borderlands um, between 1820 and 1850, borderland entrepreneurs might be a farmer, ferry boat owner, and they courted one middle class family at a time. You are looking here at Weehawken, New Jersey, across the Hudson River from downtown Manhattan. And if you look very carefully, right here, you'll notice some commuters waiting to get on a ferry boat. Mm -hmm. And right over here, you'll see the tallest structures on the Manhattan skyline, steeples of churches, and masts of ships. So these early entrepreneurs sold farmhouses in the outskirts of the metropolitan area, one at a time, and farm lots to families who wanted a different lifestyle. And those families were often carrying how-to books by authors such as Andrew Jackson Downing and Catherine Beecher, manuals that showed people how to convert a farm to a suburban dwelling. Here we have the common farm without any improvements, and here's the common farm turned into a suburban estate with a picturesque landscaping on the drive and a kitchen garden and an orchard behind the main house. After 10 years of improvement. And here's Catherine Beecher's manual, The American Woman's Home, which was a bestseller in this period, emphasized the role of the woman gaining her reward in heaven for 
taking care of family life while a husband commuted to a faraway city and dealt with the ups and downs of capitalism. And along with the manuals <coughs> came certain devices people might buy, such as the lawnmower marketed uh, to men, and women might complain of isolation and domestic drudgery, especially if they were in those suburban places without servants. One woman of the time called it Lonelyville. So we come to pattern number two, which is the picturesque enclave, beginning about 1850. Groups of people choose the suburban lifestyle, and they go together to a place which has been designed by a professional architect or landscape architect to provide a lifestyle that also includes some common land, which will be parkland for shared community activities. We're looking here at Welland Park in New Jersey, and 50, about 50 families had uh, properties there. They bought in what they hoped was a community of like-minded people. They were generally people of means, and the houses were substantial. This is a house by A.J. Davis, the architect who designed the community. These were social radicals, though. They were called long-haired men and short-haired women. In that period, that was a sign that you were looking for change in your lifestyle. And indeed, they had some similar uh, they had some friends in nearby communitarian socialist experiments in New Jersey who also thought that if you could just get the model for a community worked out properly, then the world would copy it and social change would occur. Well, the picturesque suburb was such a model. Here's a May Day celebration in the park, at Llewellyn Park in the 1860s. Riverside, Illinois was designed by the famous landscape architect Olmsted in 1869. That was an even larger and uh, ultimately more famous picturesque enclave. But as the picturesque enclave started to be copied, we'll notice that they become aggressively gated. This is the gate of a private residence inside a gated community at Tuxedo Park, New York. And here's the sign saying that the Country Club District in Kansas City founded by J.C. Nichols, who's a very prominent 20th century developer, is restricted. And that means no billboards, and it also means all kinds of social restrictions, racial restrictions on who can own property. So the picturesque enclaves established a model for wealthy families, um, it treated the landscape well in some respects, uh, but it had many things we'd consider social shortcomings. And the next phase, number landscape number three, is a suburb that's built for a very different group of people. The streetcar build-outs between the 1870s and the 1920s were our first phase of mass suburbanization in the United States. There were large subdividers of land, and they extended their sub, uh, their streetcar and sometimes subway lines out from the centers of cities and built one, two, and three family dwellings along those transportation lines. So here you're looking at an aerial image of Fairhaven, just outside of New Haven, where I teach. And you'll notice in this aerial image, while there are some cars on the streets, these houses were not built uh, primarily for automobiles. They don't have prominent driveways and garages. They were often built for occupancy by three families, one to a floor. So these are working class suburban dwellings. Often the transit owners were also the real estate developers. Kickbacks and bribes were common. There were lots of small builders who made uh, the dwellings, uh, although the subdividers were often major landowners. The builders were small builders. And here's a typical set of uh, triplexes in the Boston area. These streetcar build-outs vary by where you are in the United States. As you go further west, they tended to be uh, more single-family dwellings and fewer multiple dwellings. Uh, here we are in Chicago. This is the advertising for Samuel Gross. You note he shows little brick houses and lots of flowers and leaves. Um, in fact, Gross's de developments were usually pretty dense, and here's the site plan. There's not much landscaping on this. You can notice the train line. 
women in these streetcar build-outs were sometimes staying at home, taking in borders, taking in laundry. They might raise chickens and grow food. It's a much more sustainable community approach than in the picturesque enclaves. Commercial uses were mixed in. Rare big builder like Samuel Gross had a lot of lots to sell. He promoted excursion trains, taking people to the site of suburban land sales, and the sales were under tents. So it was almost like a religious revival, except they had lots and lots of beer. And in the West, there were land sales like